Trans Health Program um, for a presentation about trans rights um, in healthcare. Um, my name is Taylor Brown. I am a attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union. I'm based in New York and I work in our LGBT and HIV um, project. Prior to being at the ACLU, I was at um, an organization called Lambda Legal. Um, and Lambda Legal, I did basically the same work, um, impact litigation, policy advocacy, and education, um, mainly on behalf of transgender people and advocating for transgender rights. Um, and specifically um, in the areas of healthcare and education. Um, healthcare is something that I'm very passionate about, and so I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, I'm gonna have a um, sort of, what I anticipate hopefully will be a um, um, brief presentation. Um, and then I know that this is being streamed to Facebook Live. Um, and so if there are questions, I think that I encourage them um, for anyone who's watching. Um, this program is being recorded. And I believe that um, after the session's over, it will be available with closed captions. Um, so I'm gonna dive right in now um, to my handy dandy PowerPoint to get us started. All right. Okay, so let's start out with the basics. Um, and so what is healthcare discrimination? Um, so when I think about it, I typically think of it in three different buckets. And so health insurance exclusions, um, those are things that we have tackled through a variety of means, or I have tackled um, through a variety of means, including litigation. Um, and it's something that's super important. Um, and so these exclusions can come into three, these come in three forms, um, categorical exclusions. And so these are plans. Um, um, and when I say plans, I mean private plans, um, uh, state plans like state employee health plans or Medicaid programs, um, or any private insurance that you purchase from the marketplace. And these plans, um, um, some would have um, um, illegal categorical exclusions. And that means that they categorically exclude all healthcare when it's provided in relation to the treatment of gender dysphoria is usually how it's framed. Um, partial exclusions are something that we're seeing more of. Um, so these partial exclusions are plans that provide some health care for transgender people um, um, when it's for the treatment of gender dysphoria. So this means hormones are usually typically covered, um, um, psychological services, lab services are usually covered, and then some um, um, gender confirmation surgeries. Usually the, the ones that we see are related to um, primary sexual characteristics that are usually covered. And then the plan will have a host of exclusions for surgeries like facial feminization surgery, um, body contouring, um, all the things that are typically um, stereotyped as cosmetic, uh, but are often medically necessary for trans people, these plans will continue to exclude. And again, in my view and in our movement's view, these are still unlawful under, um, under the law. And then there are also sex specific exclusions. And so this is when your health plan um, has has care that is only provided um, um, to one quote unquote sex. Um, and so if you need, if you identify, um, uh, uh, or if your insurance gender marker um, says male and you um, are seeking a hysterectomy and they will deny that because they have categorized it as a female only service. Um, and so those are also, also unlawful. Um, um, in our view, and we challenge those kinds of exclusions as well. Um, the second kind of discrimination that we often see is denial of service. Um, and so this comes in a variety of forms. And this is whenever um, you walk into a healthcare um, provider or facility or what have you, and you are denied service based on a variety of reasons. Um, this can come in the form of um, religious affiliation of a hospital or facility. We have had cases where, um, and we have current cases, where a hospital is affiliated with um, the church um, uh, or some religion, uh, it's often Catholic churches um, and Catholic hospitals, and they have canceled um, surgeries because they are being, because they are for transgender people. Um, and that is a form of discrimination. Um, a facility or a provider claiming not to provide um, gender confirming healthcare, this is also uh, um, a, a common one that we get. So in these situations, you know, there are 
laws and sort of rights within the medical profession where a provider who does not feel competent to provide care can deny service. And that's right, because you don't want someone who, who doesn't know what they're doing to be providing your medical care, especially care when it comes to surgical care that's advanced and that is going to change your life forever and um, um, could run the risk of serious complications and what have you. You want someone who's competent and knowledgeable. And so that's different than not wanting to provide gender confirming healthcare because you're uncomfortable with trans people. So where a provider say provides hormones to someone with an endocrine disorder, um, someone with a thyroid disorder, but then they tell a trans person that I can't provide you hormones, that's a little different. And that's the kind of discrimination that we want to root out and that we want to tackle. Um, and again, that's just, again, this leads into it, just denial of service based on transgender status. And Again, we live in a country, especially now, I'll highlight where people feel the, they feel like they have the, um, the right often um, to discriminate openly um, against people who they do not like based on their race, based on their um, um, trans status, based on their sexual orientation, and will tell people that to their face. And that's especially the kind of discrimination that we want to um, um, hear about and that we want to um, tackle. Um, and then pharmacy discrimination is another um, um, situation that we see too. And so this is where um, we first, I think we first saw these things. Um, our movement and the fight for LGBT rights is intimately tied um, to the reproductive rights movement. And so a lot of our, our case laws intertwined, um, it's intimately tied with both reproductive justice and also um, with the Black Lives Movement because all of these um, sort of minority statuses and, and where the government is trying to assert control and discriminate against people because of who they are, um, the case law has developed um, to a point where a lot of it is intertwined and we've used arguments. And so in the um, reproductive rights space, we saw a lot of cases where pharmacists would refuse um, um, people who were having an abortion or seeking abortion and were using um, the pill form, um, they would deny filling it based on religious objections. And again, that is discrimination um, um, under a variety of laws um, potentially. And so we encourage people to report that kind of discrimination as well. Um, and then lastly, um, this goes into sort of what I was saying before, um, people feeling entitled to disrespect people and to discriminate against them openly because of their personal uh, problems. Um, and this can come in the form of misgendering, dead naming, disparaging um, remarks, um, and this can come from anyone. And so I think that when you think about healthcare discrimination, I encourage people to think about it broadly. It's not just um, um, your, you know, your doctor, it's the people that you interact with at the door, it's the administrative staff, it's the nurses, it's the folks at pharmacies, um, it's the folks at lab services where you may have to go external. Um, any person um, who is discriminating um, against you in a healthcare setting, um, it, it can constitute unlawful healthcare discrimination. Um, and then another thing that we see that people often don't think of are insurance contractors like transportation services and home health aides. Um, and so especially under Medicaid and Medicare um, and a lot of state-based programs and private insurance, they'll have provisions that provide for um, at-home care or they'll have transportation services, especially Medicaid. And Medicaid and those, Medicaid, Medicare and those um, uh, private insurance companies, if they are receiving federal funds, have a duty to make sure that the people that they contract with to provide these services are complying with the ACA and with other applicable laws. And so we've seen horrible cases where um, I remember one situation I was involved in, um, there was a trans woman who encountered a horribly transphobic um, driver who was transporting her to her appointment. And one day he, set, he put her out in the middle of the road um, on a very hot day, um, um, she was an um, older woman as well and left her there um, and had been discriminating against her for a long time, saying nasty things and um, disparaging remarks. And ultimately, the lady had to walk um, almost half a mile, an older woman in like Georgia heat, which is, you know, uh, if you've ever lived in the South, which you all are in Kentucky, so you understand it's miserable. Um, that's discrimination. And that's the kind of things that... Um, that we want to hear about. And so outlining these, the primary purpose is just so people understand, you know, I want, we want, I want you to understand what healthcare discrimination is. And I want you to understand that because it needs to be reported. Um, in the fight for healthcare 
rights for transgender people. Um, there are a variety of ways that we go we go about it. It can be done through education. It can be done through you know just demand letters where we simply request that a policy is changed. Um, but oftentimes we do have to sue. And in order to sue, we need people who have faced discrimination. And so I always want people to be on the lookout. Don't take it. Don't just assume that, you know, this was a one-off. Any kind of the, any kind of behavior like that is inappropriate and should be reported, um, especially if this is a facility um, um, or healthcare provider that is receiving federal funds. So what does the law say? So this is the fun part um, for me anyway, um, to be a little bit of the um, nerdy part. Um, so taking a look at where you're at, um, I didn't go into locality um, protections, usually in the healthcare space, locality protections. Um, and so that just means like the city that you live in or the county or what have you, those protections are usually weak. Um, and so I didn't really dive into those and I just took a broader approach and looked at what Kentucky has on the books. And unsurprisingly, like many Southern states, um, um, I don't know, does Kentucky, do you all consider yourself a, um, a Southern state? I, when I think of Kentucky, I do. So um, I'm from North Carolina, so I, I I think I can say what's Southern and what's not. <laughs> um, but for Kentucky, again, like many Southern states, lacks protections um, for trans folks, especially in the healthcare um, arena. Um, and so there is the Kentucky Civil Rights Act. Um, like any good attorney, you will see that I have a million Westlaw pages open um, because I'm always working and doing research. Um, so this is the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights. Um, so we'll leave that up for just a moment. Um, so this basically is, um, well, it's a pretty weak civil rights statute um, um, that, that's aimed to mirror sort of federal protections that we have. Um, unfortunately, the Kentucky Civil Rights Act, um, the public accommodations provision, um, explicitly excludes um, sex um, in their um, protections. And so there's no way um, a, a hospital and healthcare providers are usually covered as public accommodations. And so where um, um, you know, they've removed sex discrimination and there are no explicit provisions for sexual orientation or gender identity discrimination. Um, you know, we don't have a, a, a claim based in state law, um, which is to be expected and, you know, is not fatal. Um, I will say though that in looking, reviewing it, um, the public accommodations provision in Kentucky does have a disability discrimination provision. And there is a new trend in federal law under the ADA where trans people are suing um, for disability discrimination. And so if you do consider yourself with someone with a disability that is sourced in you being trans, be it gender dysphoria or something other that has limited your life in some way or you're perceived as having a disability, it is arguable that um, there could be a colorable claim for disability discrimination um, under under the Kentucky statute. But again, I didn't see any case law to that. Uh, I think that's it's new in the federal courts, um, and so I would imagine in state courts, it's, it's especially in southern state courts, um, um, it's probably pretty rare. <laughs> Um, but I will say Kentucky does have um, employment protections that does include on the basis of sex, and it has explicit um, um, explicit case law that says that the Kentucky employment non-discrimination laws mirror the Title VII laws, which I'll talk about in a, in a second. And as you all know, um, last, was it last month, August, September, no, no, it was um, July, June or July, um, we had the big win in the um, uh, Bostock v. Clayton County um, that made clear that when an employer fires someone for being transgender or um, um, LGB, well, maybe not bi, but L LG at least, um, they have violated Title VII. And so that was huge. And so the fact that Kentucky recognizes that their employment statute mirrors Title VII, um, 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 where there's been sex discrimination in employment, and we'll get to how that ties into healthcare in a moment, um, you could have arguably a claim under there. Um, and so I raised that um, to say that, uh, well, uh, I'll talk about it in a moment. I think it'll make sense when I get when I get to the insurance section that we're going to talk about. Um, but just remember that under Kentucky law in employment, um, you may have a claim for sex discrimination um, if you're discriminated against in healthcare. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Federal protections. So federal protections are where we have the strongest protections as trans people across the country. Um, we, as a movement, and this is a variety of organizations, um, ACLU. Lambda Legal, 
National Center for Lesbian Rights, um, GLAD, all of the organizations that have sort of been the leaders in our movement and who are currently and have been fighting for our rights um, have been primarily doing it in the federal courts under federal law and the US Constitution. Um, because for a variety of reasons, um, um, which you know we can get into if you want to be nerdy, but mainly you know when you're arguing um, in federal court, the idea is that you're going to get to an appeals court, and when you're ever, whenever you're in that appeals court, you all are in the Sixth Circuit, which is fortunate, um, which I'll talk about uh, in just a moment. Um, but the Sixth Circuit includes Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So any law that comes out of the Sixth Circuit is applicable to um, um, all of those states. Versus if you were to sue in a state court um, um, like Kentucky, it would just affect Kentucky. And so our goal is to impact as many people as possible. And so that's why federal courts are naturally preferred and why we, um, um, and of course the federal government stands for all of us. And so the law, um, federal law and constitutional law should protect trans people just as it protects everyone else. Um, so the strongest, of course, is 14th Amendment equal protection claims. Um, the Affordable Care Act is another um, strong source of protections. The Affordable Care Act is fairly new and, of course, has been challenged um, um, and is currently, um, so currently there's a case that's out of Texas um, and this, that, that case has enjoined the, um, the Section 1557 provisions. But I want people to know that the ACA is still law and is still in effect. All that means is that um, health, the Department of Health and Human Services can't investigate discrimination based on um, uh, trans status. Um, but that doesn't mean individuals can't still sue um, um, entities that are covered by the ACA for discrimination. And so I just want to put that out there. We're still bringing ACA claims. And I think the ACA, I, I believe in my heart and I hope that the ACA will survive um, It's this latest attack in the Supreme Court and, and will still be um, um, the law. Um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So this is an important law. Um, again, we just had that huge win in the Bostock v. Clayton County, um, making clear that sex discrimination does include discrimination against transgender people and lesbian and gay people. Um, and so some of that, that case was about being fired. But there are other cases under Title VII about employees who have health care plans who are, who had categorical or partial exclusions. And those courts are routinely finding that those exclusions are unlawful sex discrimination under Title VII. So where your employer is providing your health insurance and they have a plan that excludes healthcare for transition related healthcare, you may have a claim for discrimination and you should, I think, report that. Um, and I, again, later down the slide, I'll, I'll say who you should report to and, and give some suggestions. Um, and that sort of ties back to the Kentucky statute, which mirrors Title VII in employment. Um, but again, no one's ever brought a claim to my knowledge like that under Kentucky law, um, but um, it is there and potentially available um, for employers who are covered. And then another one that people often forget is Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. Um, so Title IX um, was the big uh, addition of sex discrimination protections um, for for schools receiving um, federal funding. And so in colleges um, that offer health insurance plans, um, most colleges, public colleges that receive federal funding, um, um, it's now the law under the ACA that colleges have to make sure that everyone's insured. So colleges will sometimes contract to have their own plans. Under Title IX, under the Affordable Care Act and under the Equal Protection Clause, those, those schools should not have plans that discriminate based on gender identity and exclude um, the transition related health care or, or health care for the treatment of gender dysphoria. And so that's another protection that we uh, we have used in courts to sue schools um, who are discriminating against their employees and discriminating against their um, enrolled students. Um, and also, um, I should say Title IX is also, it's been, the children of employees have also been found to be protected um, under Title IX. So if you are uh, um, a cis parent working at a university and you have a trans child and your child is being denied health care under your, your university employer sponsored health plan, um, you know, you could have a right of action under that and you should report that kind of discrimination. Ultimately, I think, I think what I'm trying to accomplish here and what I'm trying to say is that you should report discrimination of any kind, anywhere, and we will evaluate it and hopefully find some kind of legal avenue um, um, to tackle that discrimination. Um, as I mentioned, you all are in the Sixth Circuit. The Sixth Circuit is where the Bossock case came from. It came out of, originally started in Michigan. Um, 
I believe. I don't, yeah, fact check me on that. I believe it was Michigan. Um, the Sixth Circuit, though, has been, was one of the earliest circuits to affirm the rights of transgender people in employment starting in 2004. So the Smith v. City of Salem case, the Barnes v. City of Cincinnati, um, these were cases that, um, where the Sixth Circuit ruled that where an employer takes an adverse action or does something bad to a trans employee, they violated Title VII, and it is sex discrimination. Um, and Dodds v. U.S. Department of Education, this was a Title IX case and an equal protection case where the court came out the same way. Um, and then, of course, the, the EEOC versus um, RG and GR Harris Funeral Homes, that was the um, um, original case that about trans discrimination. Um, and so thank you to the Sixth Circuit for an incredible opinion that got us to the Supreme Court and resulted in this huge win that I think means so much now for um, the fight for trans rights across the spectrum, um, but especially in healthcare, because these healthcare cases have, um, they have, um, they're, they're in the courts now. Um, when I was at Lambda Legal, I was um, lead counsel in a case against the state of North Carolina. Um, in that case, the state of North Carolina had a um, exclusion in their health insurance plan um, for state employees. And in that situation, um, it was found that the uh, we were uh, survived a motion to dismiss, um, and we got a great opinion out of the district court, um, which I believe is being appealed to the, the they're in the Fourth Circuit. Um, and I also was involved in a case called Fletcher v. Alaska, um, which was against the state of Alaska for discrimination in their state employee health plan. Um, and so I think that the outlook is good, um, but we just need people to assert their rights and to report discrimination um, in every sort of facet of life so that we have avenues to, to challenge that discrimination. I want to make sure that, oh, so there are some questions. Okay, just wanted to check and make sure that wasn't anything um, that I needed to pay attention, but thank you for the question. I'll get to that um, um, when my presentation is over and I encourage more questions. I want to make this as relatable and realistic to people's everyday life as possible. I know sometimes this can be um, sort of abstract, um, um, but I just wanted to run through sort of this legal stuff so people know, hopefully, the, the takeaway from this is that there are potential legal protections in a variety of settings, and so you should report the discrimination. Oh, okay. So the next slide is um, paying for and access to health care. And of course, this is the biggest issue for trans people um, um, often. Um, and so insurance options that are available are the Children's Health Insurance Program, which is basically Medicaid for people under the age of um, 18. Um, Medicaid, um, which is defined by each state, you know, I do believe that Kentucky has expanded Medicaid. So I think that more people are eligible for Medicaid um, in Kentucky versus other southern states. Um, Medicare um, for people who are, I believe, 65 plus. Um, another often the most common form of insurance for Americans. Um, is employer or school-sponsored health insurance. And then private plans from, um, um, oh yeah, so private plans that you purchase from the marketplace from insurance companies, like major insurance companies like Cigna, Aetna, United Healthcare, um, and all of like the local ones that are, that vary by geography. Um, and so I encourage people to apply for, um, um, if you don't have insurance, um, I encourage you to apply for Medicaid, even if you don't think you meet the income guidelines. Um, I would apply in a way, and especially if you have a disability, I would encourage you to apply. Um, um, but all insurance plans, I think, are getting better as a result of the variety of litigation um, that's going on. And so I think I always encourage people, if you can get insurance, get insurance. Um, for the uninsured, though, um, which a lot of trans people often do find themselves uninsured, um, of course, you can pay out of pocket, which is usually impossible um, just because of employment statistics and trans people just not having access to credit and money um, um, like the rest of our, um, you know, our counterparts in this country. Um, I do want to point out, though, that many hospitals offer sliding scales. Um, and so it's basically their form of Medicaid. Sometimes they'll call it um, charity care, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, um, and hospitals are one of the biggest ones. And, I, and this is sort of 
I found that a lot of people are aware of this. And so I always mention it in my, in my talks now because I think it's really important. And I'm actually really interested for people to try to start using this avenue, people who don't have insurance or who are underinsured. Um, if you have a plan that excludes it um, um, and you're not doing like a legal challenge maybe and you, you, know, you apply for one of these um, um, and you're eligible for one of these charity care programs. So, um, so one thing I'll talk about. So let's look at this right here. So I don't, I will say, um, just as a, an ethical issue, you know, I can't recommend providers or, you know, suggest providers. And so this is no way an endorsement of UK, Health, UK healthcare or the Transform Health Services. Um, but a trend that we see is that a lot of major universities who have medical schools um, are, are providing transition-related healthcare. And there are a number of leading schools um, like NYU and, um, um, a school called uh, Mount Sinai uh, or the Mount Hospital. I, I can't. I can't remember what school it's affiliated with, um, but they're training fellows, medical residents, and fellows in transition-related surgery from other parts of the country, and then those folks come back to their schools um, and um, start getting these programs up and running. And so there is one um, at at the University of Kentucky Healthcare Services. Um, again, I can't you know, testify to the quality of the care, um, but it's just something that I want to, um, that I'm sure a lot of you know about, um, and it lists everything that they do and the services that they provide. Um, and it's just good to go to a place that you know that may have some competence. You know, you want to go somewhere where you hopefully um, are talking to someone who you don't have to educate, but you should always be prepared. Um, Self-advocacy is the most important advocacy, um, I believe. And so, you have this facility that is providing this healthcare, um, and this goes for all healthcare, not even just transition-related healthcare. Um, so also there, um, you'll see that they have this, which is what a lot of people do not realize. So financial assistance, um, and so you'll see here they say, UK Healthcare offers a financial assistance program for patients who receive emergency or medically necessary services and meet the eligibility requirements. And these are usually income-based requirements. And so you'll be asked to provide or provided affidavit. Usually they'll ask you for either um, um, income statements or they'll ask you for, if, you, if you're not employed, they'll ask you to, you know, swear that you're not employed and you're not lying. And, you know, if they ever did launch an investigation and found out that you did lie, then, you know, they could to you for the recovery of those costs. But if you are not employed, if you do qualify for Medicaid, you likely qualify for this kind of financial assistance program too. And they'll cover things that Medicaid excludes as long as they're medically necessary, um, or they, at least they should. Um, and so I always encourage people, um, usually the determination that they make is, is it lasts for a year, um, and it can also be retroactively ap applied for a year. Um, um, and again, that's, I, uh, that's how I've seen it in a lot of different hospitals, but make sure that you read the terms. And so if you go to one of these places, I would first and always, you can just print out the, um, the, uh, the form here um, and it will give you instructions. Looks like they have it in English and Spanish, which is helpful. Um, and also read the policy. Um, but if they're providing medically necessary, say um, uh, mammoplasty for a cis, um, um, a cis person um, um, or um, a trans man who has had um, um, cancer um, or anything like that, um, then they should provide medically necessary top surgery um, for a trans woman um, or um, um, any other service that is you know, provided for the treatment of another condition besides gender dysphoria um, and where it's considered medically necessary for gender dysphoria, um, it should be covered under policies like these. And so I tell, I, what I want to see and like a case that I'd be interested in is a facility that denies someone um, that care. Um, I think that would be unlawful under the ACA. And so I encourage people to apply for it and at least try, um, you never know. Um, and they usually give um, it can either be a 0% discount where you have to pay nothing based on your income, or they'll give you um, very reduced costs um, um, for the care. Um, and so just flagging that for folks. And there's usually residency requirements and things like that as too. Um, I'm just going to flag that. Um, and then, of course, there's grants. Um, my mentor and great friend, he is an amazing um, trans man. His name is Drew Levisser. He's an attorney. He now works at the, he's worked at Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, 
Lambda Legal, and now um, the National LGBT Bar, Drew's amazing, and Drew um, started the Jim Collins Foundation, which provides grants to trans people um, for surgery. And I know that um, the Kentucky Health Justice Network also has um, helps with financial assistance to some degree, um, and you can apply um, on their website as well. But there are also other organizations that I encourage people to look into, the Darcy Jetta Corbett, um, Point of Pride Annual Transgender Surgery Fund, um, the Happy Transgender Center grant and the Trans Lifeline micro grants. And so these are grants usually based on annual cycles where you apply. Um, they'll ask you just for usually, you know, a statement as to why you need surgery, your circumstances and things like that. And then they will um, provide um, um, care. Um, yeah, provide, the, provide money for some level of care that you um, require. Um, I want to get back up to the insurance um, um, portion. So I do want to flag too. So for CHIP, I, trans youth do have um, the right to appropriate medical care. And so uh, CHIP standard is a little bit different than the Medicaid standard for the coverage of care. So I often see trans, um, trans youth who, who are approved under CHIP where they may be denied under Medicaid. And so I encourage people to don't be you know, discouraged from seeking the care you need just because of age. If you're Medicaid eligible and you're insured under the CHIP program, um, you should be able to receive the care that you need. Um, and uh, I want to also put out there, so for Medicaid, um, I, for Kentucky, we, what I know now um, as a practitioner is that Kentucky has no explicit guidelines for the coverage of um, transition-related healthcare. So I've never received an intake from someone who has been denied transition-related health care under Kentucky Medicaid, but I would like one. So if you are being denied um, that kind of care, then you should definitely reach out to my organization or um, the Trans Health Justice Network, and perhaps they could go in contact with me. Um, but for now, since we don't know and they don't have an explicit exclusion, it's hard for us to challenge, um, challenge it um, because we don't have anyone who's reported it to us. Um, and so that's why it's so critical for people to truly report discrimination. I know that it can seem daunting or seem like it's not gonna pay off, but at the end of the day, it pays off in so many ways. It pays off in A, potential litigation that we could bring. B, it pays off in data that we need. As we know, the Trump administration refuses to collect information about gender identity, sexual orientation. They told the CDC they can't say the word transgender. It, you know, and so we're erased from data. And that kind of erasure is horrible for us in terms of fighting for our rights because data see drives policy, data see data drives legislation, and data drives litigation sometimes. And so it's so, so, so important. Um, you know, we can do FOIA requests to see how many complaints, even though they haven't followed up on these complaints, how many complaints have been launched. Um, and there's just so many things that um, benefit not only you, but the whole trans community when you could, when you um, report discrimination that you faced. Um, and so for now, I say that Medicaid um, does not have explicit guidelines. Um, and so I don't know if people are being covered or if they are being covered, um, but if you are being denied, you should report it. Um, and hopefully we can um, potentially do something about it. Um, and I'm also, from what I know, apparently the, um, the Kentucky State Employee Health Program does cover, does have explicit provisions to cover transition-related health care. Um, so this is for state employees of Kentucky, which includes university employees um, or public university employees. And so that's what we know. If, if anyone is listening to this and out there and it's to the contrary, again, please report. Like that's the only way we know is from people's experiences. Um, but it does look like they actually have published explicit coverage guidelines. Um, but if they do have, say, like a partial exclusion in their plan, that's still unlawful um, and, um, you know, it should be challenged. Um, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything that I wanted to say in this. <sighs> Another thing I also want to flag for people who are under Medicaid is that where you can't find competent care, um, Medicaid is required to find that care. And so there's a test that they do called a provider sufficiency test. Um, and they look at your location and they see where you're at. And if there are no providers that can provide that care within a certain radius, um, um, like a, a feasible travel radius, um, then sometimes they'll have to get you that care either out of state and pay for that kind of travel, or sometimes they'll have agreements with neighboring states um, um, or border states. Um, that provide that care that will accept Kentucky Medicaid. And, um, and you can also sometimes work one-time agreements. And so I just always encourage people to reach out for help um, if you have been denied. Um, you, you know, it may not be the, the end. 
see how I'm doing on time. Okay, doing great. All right, insurance denials. Appeal, okay, <laughs> so I put this in all caps because it's so, so, so important to appeal. Um, whenever you're denied, under the ACA, there are paperwork requirements, as in your insurer is required to send you um, certain paperwork outlining the denial, the reason for the denial, and also uh, options for appeal. And so sometimes there will be internal appeals. Uh, you should exhaust those internal appeals. If it's one level of appeal, if it's two level of appeals, um, um, do it because sometimes you can um, you can forego your rights if you don't appeal within a certain timeline. Usually it's about 30 days from the from the adverse determination or the denial. And so you'll have to start all over again. So I tell people to always make sure that you read the paperwork that comes in the mail along with your denial. And if you don't get the paperwork, you should call your doctor and ask for it because the doctor should have a copy as well. Or you should call the Medicaid folks or whoever your insurance folks are and request that paperwork because you are entitled to it um, and it does affect your rights. Um, Kentucky, under the ACA, all states um, um, that, again, are accepting federal funding for health care are required to set up these external review boards. And so Kentucky, you know, there are a lot of states who have requested extensions and have still yet to set up these ex external review boards, um, even though the law mandates it. Um, but the Kentucky Department of Insurance does have one um, and explains sort of your rights about this. And so can involve a denial based on determination by the insurer that a benefit service treatment drug is not medically necessary, considered experimental investigational. Um, and those are usually the denials that we, we see sometimes that are sort of a, a pretext for um, healthcare discrimination for trans people. So appeal, 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 appeal. Ask your provider to be a part of the appeals process. They usually have to submit kind, some kind of statement, um, but I'll just make sure that you're availing yourselves of all your rights um, um, in that situation. And I think that I think that's perhaps one of the services that um, Kentucky Health Justice Network offers um, sort of navigating insurance and knowing these things because it's not common knowledge. Um, but hopefully through these kinds of presentations and these kinds of um, and organizations like um, um, the Trans Health Program and the um, through Kentucky Health Justice Network um, can, you know, help educate trans people more on sort of their availability of um, um, access to care. Um, another thing that is um, extremely helpful, so the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, um, so they have a trans health project. Um, again, I believe self-advocacy is the best advocacy and where it starts. Like we have to know our rights and we have to assert our rights. Um, I mean, that's key and that's crucial. And so it's where you're able to, um, please do, or please reach out and seek assistance. Um, but TELDEP is an amazing organization. They do cutting edge litigation and they have wonderful attorneys there who, um, um, who are majority trans and are doing a lot of great things. This is TELDEP's website. Um, and I have, I've taken this PDF and made it, I've taken this PowerPoint, made it into a PDF and made it available to um, Trans Health Justice Network. And so if I'm sure if you request it, they'll make it available or they'll put it as an attachment on the Facebook link. Um, and it has all of these hyperlinks. And so you'll be able to go. But I just want to flag that TELDEP has this amazing sort of self-advocacy hub where you can go and, you know, they actually have um, um, video tutorials where they have, I believe it's um, um, my colleague Noah Lewis, who is an amazing trans attorney, um, explaining in videos, sort of um, walking through all of these things, choosing a plan, understanding your plan, um, resources. And so whenever you're filing an appeal, you know, like there are so many things here. Um, tools. Tools is probably the most important section, but sort of the legal analysis. Um, medical necessity literature. These are things that you can submit with your appeals to sort of reinforce the medical necessity of your care. And, and you know, they're here. All you got to do is download them. You don't have to really change anything. Um, and sometimes it sort of, you know, puts them on notice that, hey, I know my rights and I may sue you if you don't, if you don't provide this care. Um, and so, and training materials for advocates too. And so it's a great resource. It's freely available. Um, and so I encourage people to use it. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. And so what to include, um, and again, so I just say denial of paperwork sent to you by your health insurance provider, which I, which I mentioned is sort of mandated by the Affordable Care Act, the paperwork that they have to send you, um, your WPATH letters, um, letter from your surgeon or practitioner, the legal memo that's available through TELDEF, 
um, and then nothing extraneous, um, and then whatever else is required by Kentucky via the form above. I've met a lot of trans people who are wonderful people advocating for themselves, non-lawyers, and you know, not really, um, and you know, you don't have to be a lawyer, um, but you know, they'll send like reams and reams of medical documentation and things like that. But you just always have to remember that this is a government entity. You want to watch what you send them. It's something that you don't know what they're going to do with. You don't know how long they're going to keep it. You don't know how long it could affect you um, down the road. And so I always say, make sure that it's streamlined, keep it to the point, provide the documentation that's required by WPATH and that's it. Um, um, and then, you know, the things that are, aren't personal like the legal memo. Um, I always say another thing too is just always have multiple copies of all of your things. Um, keep them organized. Um, it's just, you know, I have a whole notebook of my medical records, um, like many trans people do, um, just so that I'm always prepared. Like, should there be a denial and should I, should I have to sort of, you know, go through this routine with you, um, the insurance company, um, you know, it's, you're always prepared. And I think that, you know, it empowers people and it shows the insurance company that you're not going to back down um, um, from a fight. And you shouldn't. And then, yeah, I think the only other note I had was making sure you are aware of deadlines, 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 deadlines. And usually there are around 30 day deadlines. Um, and so you always just want to make sure you're, those, you're cognizant of those and you're not blowing it because once you miss the deadline, it's sort of you're back at square one. You're going to have to resubmit for prior authorization, um, get the denial, potentially go through another internal appeal, yada, yada, yada. And it's just going to put more time on sort of the, the calendar for you that you need. like you know, that you could potentially be getting the care that you need. And so um, I always say, just make sure that you're aware of those um, um, deadlines and hang in there. Yeah, I, I'm i very aware that um, it's easy for me from my perspective, I think, to, um, to, to, you know, say self-advocacy is so important and it is. And that's why, you know, I want to give people the tools and make it as easily accessible. But I know it's not easy and I know it's hard to deal with these um, you know, I'm originally from the South, I'm a North Carolinian, I grew up on Medicaid, um, and, you know, I took a, most of my, the first half of my 20s just fighting health insurance companies to get the care that I needed, fighting my employer to get the health care that I needed. Um, and so I'm extremely passionate about it, and I want to see trans people um, empowered because, you know, it's, it's your health care and it's the things that you need. And so I want people to, to fight for what they need, and I'm, of course, here fighting as much as I can for folks um, um, who, who report discrimination. But um, that's why I'm so happy that um, um, Kentucky Health Justice Network reached out um, about this presentation because it's just so timely. And hopefully, you know, with the new administration, um, things will get better um, on, on the healthcare front. But it's never been more important for people to stand up for, um, stand up for themselves in our community and adjacent communities. Um, 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 that were so, you know, linked to, especially um, Black folks and the Black Lives Matter movement. So other resources. So whenever I was saying about reporting, um, there are a host of places that you can report to. Obviously, I'm biased because I work at the ACLU, um, um, but um, the ACLU of Kentucky has a reporting um, page that you can, um, oh, sorry, hold on, let me go back. Where's my mouse? Um, has a page where you can report. Um, da, 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 take action. Okay, actually, I think they'd make it easier to. <laughs> okay, I guess LU of Kentucky, um, volunteer with us. Okay, well, there's somewhere on here where you can file discrimination complaints. Um, and so I encourage you to file with them. Um, whenever it's an LGBT issue, I, um, you know, we have affiliates in every state and usually the affiliate will reach out to my project um, about LGBT discrimination. Um, and so that's how we sort of become aware of it and can get involved. Um, the Kentucky Health Justice Network is obviously a resource as well. And then my, where I work ex um, expressly is the National LGBT and HIV Project. And so we have a, um, a, a help email as well. Um, but again, I mentioned all those other organizations. It's really up to you and what you're comfortable with. Um, um, but there are so many organizations like Tell Deaf, like Land Illegal, all of those places where you can report discrimination. Um, and we're all, even though we're like quote unquote competitors, um, we're in a movement together and we're all fighting for the same thing. And so where we don't have capacity or where we don't have expertise, we often refer people to other organizations that can't handle um, um, the needs 
that um, that folks have that we can't meet. Um, I'm, you know, I have a lot of confidence and I feel um, um, that I can do a lot. And so I just encourage people to reach out to the ACLU. I think it's, um, um, I love my project. I love the work that I do. And um, um, healthcare rights and fights are very important to me. So um, that's, you know, that's just again my way of saying reach out to the best or go to the rest. <laughs> Um, but yay, so that was my presentation. That was 45 minutes exactly, which is great. Um, I'm going to ask for um, questions. If anyone has any questions, um, I'm gonna hang around for the next, you know, this goes until seven and so can entertain any um, questions. But it looks like the first question that we had in the chat was, where can discrimination be reported? Oh, well, is there a list of healthcare insurance providers who are trans affirming? Thank you so much. Okay, so where can discrimination be reported? Um, so I think I went through a couple of them. The Kentucky Commission on Human Rights, um, even though if it's like technically not covered, I still say report the discrimination because usually states have record keeping laws. And so sometimes it's important for us to, even if they haven't acted on a complaint because they don't think there's a, a valid claim, we can still see that and use those statistics. We can say in court, you know, the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights received 72 healthcare discrimination complaints by transgender people and didn't act. So, you know, this is a problem in Kentucky. Um, or report it, I encourage usually with LGBT organizations or trans led organizations. Um, those are, um, where I would refer. I think local is always best too. Usually your local, um, um, your local organizations are going to have sort of the most on the ground knowledge of sort of what's going on in your state. Um, I'm from a national org um, and so sometimes it's hard for me to know sort of, I have assigned states. Um, um, I think Kentucky actually may be one of my assigned states. I need to double check that. Um, but I, you know, I have a base knowledge of sort of what's going on in my states. Um, but local orgs I think are always best and then they can always reach out to national orgs for help. Um, and you can also simultaneously reach out to national orgs. Um, is there a, is there a list of healthcare insurance providers who are trans affirming? I so hmm, insurance providers. So I think there actually were some. Um, um, I think there actually are some on TELDEF. If you go back to the TELDEF resources, I'll go back and look for a second as long as we don't have any other questions, and perhaps I can pull it up um, for providers. Uh, that's a little bit more iffy. I haven't really found one that's successful. There is, there is one from an organization, which I'll pull up momentarily. Um, let's see here. Escape. Okay. Um, I'll get out of here. Oh, there we go. So, Let's see what TELDEF has. Um, trans insurance um, resources. Oh, well, trans healthcare providers. So there you go. Um, well, TELDEF does, yeah, so a lot of legal organizations, we can't provide direct medical referrals because it can be sort of a conflict. Like say we have to sue those folks at some point, you know, it's, it's gonna be hard for us to sue them whenever you know, our, they say, oh, well, you recommended these people to us. We couldn't have been that bad. And so like ethically, that kind of prevents us from making direct referrals. Um, but in terms of a list, um, these kinds of organizations, um, um, WPATH provider directory would probably be the best one to go to. And they usually break it down by region as well. Um, um, but if you do have the option of traveling, um, I mean, I'll be, I'll be playing. Um, there, I encourage people to do research, 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 research the person, especially if it's a surgeon that you're going to for um, um, care, because this is someone you need to feel extremely comfortable with, have a relationship with potentially for the rest of your life, and it may not be in Kentucky. And so if you do have the option, the means and the insurance to go out of state and you go somewhere like New York, you go somewhere like California, where some of the main providers are, um, um, you know, it's just, you just want to make sure that it's someone that you're comfortable with. Don't do it just because there's access to it. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like your only option. It's just, it's a heavy decision to make. And so I just caution people to really make sure that they, you know, ask the surgeon to see pictures and results, ask the surgeon for contact information, potentially of other patients, um, scour the web to find, um, um, 
what are those things, message boards that, you know, trans people will often discuss their experiences with certain doctors um, because, you know, I think most doctors are in this for good reasons, you know, um, but, you know, the medical industry is a profit-based industry and, you know, there's a lot of providers that have popped up recently who are providing subpar care to trans people um, and endangering their lives and um, um, disfiguring sometimes and just doing horrible things. And so you want to make sure that you've gone to someone who has a reputation or who has proven sort of, you know, they know what they're doing and that you feel comfortable with on sort of an interpersonal basis. Um, as far as insurance providers, so I know that TELDEF has this section on um, resources. So health insurance medical policies. Um, so yeah, so that's not really like a list of affirming insurance providers. I'll say like most, can I say that? Because there are so many, especially in the private market, there are so many different types of plans. I just can't imagine that there's been a list of, of health insurance plans that um, um, completely cover, or, or, or sort of a, a list that completely covers every single health insurance plan offered by you know every provider in every state. Um, so like for Kentucky, what I would encourage you to do is um, if you are looking for a plan on the marketplace or or you know your employer will usually only provide you with one option and then you'll have you can choose two or three plans but say you're in the, you're, you know, your insurance on the marketplace um, I would just look at the insurance providers and oftentimes you can find their um, you can find their coverage policies online um, and it'll tell you sort of what plans that uh, are impacted um, so like the Cigna Cigna gender dysphoria um, coverage guidelines. I'll say I'm not the biggest fan of Cigna. I find a Cigna to be one of the most discriminatory um, um, healthcare providers, but they do have some plans that are um, good. So you'll find things like this. Um, and so sometimes they'll tell you sort of in this section, you know, like what plans it applies to. Um, but yeah, it's just, and they'll tell you sort of effective date, coverage policy. And so sometimes that can be a clue, but oftentimes just calling calling them up and asking them um, um, a plan that you're investigating or you're researching and you have interest in, um, you know, that can be helpful. Okay, so it looks like we have no other questions so far. Um, um, where are we at on time? 6.51. Um, so uh, let's think, is there anything else that I want to share with you all? I'll stop the share for now. Um, I don't think that's all. Um, I think that's sort of um, all the information I wanted to share. I know it was a lot in a 45 minute um, 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 session, um, but please do reach out. Um, if you wanna reach out to me, um, you can. Um, Sometimes I hesitate to give out my email address, but you know, it's my work email address, so it is what it is. Um, but I can be reached at tbrown, um, T-B-R-O-W-N, um, at aclu.org. And um, yeah, I hope this was helpful, um, informative, and um, I look forward to hearing from you, and I wish everyone success. And yeah.